Hey guys, it's Rhinebridge Bugman, and today we are going for cocoons. Um, I get a lot of people hit me up asking about finding cocoons. Some people have a difficult time with it, some people don't. I do really well looking for cocoons. Now, I'm meeting up with a pretty good sized group of people later, so before I actually get with all those people, I'm going to do a little bit of road cruising. Um, the first trick I'm going to tell you about finding cocoons, you want to watch the sunny side of the road in this case. In other words, if I'm staring over here and I'm looking into the sun, I'm not going to find cocoons nearly as fast. If I watch this side where the sun is baking this part, the cocoons are going to stand out and they're going to pop. They're almost going to glow. They're amazing. It's really easy to find them that way. Stay with me, man. I want to try and hook you guys up, show you how to find cocoons. Look, if you're going to be, you know, dopping around uh, the edge of private property, make sure you're getting permission to access those properties. Keep in mind, man, other people live here too, and uh, you don't want to be traipsing in on people's property. Uh, simple as it is that you're just stepping off the side of the road and going a, you know, a few yards back in to get to cocoons, still get permission to access those properties. Probably one of the most important aspects of looking for cocoons is not necessarily season because you can find cocoons, you know, even when there's leaves on the trees. You just got to get there before those cocoons hatch. Look, caterpillars make these cocoons, which means the caterpillars are going to be feeding on these trees, not the adults. These large silk moths, they don't eat at all. The only reason they, they emerge and even fly is to go look for mates and expand their, their range and reproduce, but... It's the habitat that counts. So you're looking for areas that are going to hold food plant for whatever is common as far as species are common in your area. In this case, this entire creek bottom is loaded, absolutely jam-packed with spice bush. And the spice bush trees are one of the primary food plants of our really, really common Promethea silk moth. It's a small silk moth common in the eastern U.S. We're going to find a lot of those cocoons today, I suspect, because they're is a crud load of spice bush all through this creek bottom. The other nice thing is this also, this area also offers some upland area. The larger silk moths like the Cecropias and some of the things actually prefer those bigger trees. Now they may be higher up in the trees when they're caterpillars, but the caterpillars often come down and make their cocoons, sometimes completely off that food plant and sometimes low to the ground where I normally don't even look for cocoons higher than about eight or you know seven or eight feet high. Find yourself habitat that's good for your area. You want the food plant, the spice bush, the walnut, the willow, um, you know, maples. Cherry is a good one. So look for those types of habitat and search those areas out for cocoons. All right, so another key factor of looking for cocoons. Guys, you want to look in the um, very, very early spring at the latest. I preferably to go right in the heart of winter if possible. If you get a nice warm day, that's a great opportunity to go look for cocoons. Look, man, notice there are no leaves on the trees. That is a huge factor. The less junk in the trees, the easier it's going to be for you to find cocoons. So go in that time of year when they're, you know, don't wait till early spring when the leaves are starting to pop. Because again, if you add junk and camouflage into those trees, it's going to be harder to see the cocoons. Anything in the way is just going to block those cocoons off. Um, we've got a nice 60 degree day we're pushing into here and no leaves. Super, super easy to find cocoons. So let's talk about equipment because look, man, all you're doing is walking or hiking or even driving. Uh, if you're road cruising, you don't need a lot to look for cocoons. You need a pretty good set of eyes to see them. Uh, you try, once you train your eyes to find these things, they're really, really much easier than people realize. Um, but I like to have a hooked stick that I can use for reaching up in to trees and pulling things down to where I can get the, you know, some of the cocoons that are up higher. If I don't have a hook stick with me, because I don't always bring this, um, I generally don't look higher than about seven or eight feet up. Um, and if the cocoons are higher than that, oh well, then you gotta let them sit. I don't mind leaving a few cocoons behind. I don't lose sleep over that. Um, it's actually probably good that you do that. But at the same time, uh, I do like to have an advantage of making things a little bit easier on me. Um, when you're hiking, you're going to want to also have a place to put your cocoons that you find. And I will always be an 80s guy. 
So I am still using a fanny pack. Um, crazy as it sounds, I like this. It's super lightweight, and I've been using this thing for probably the better part of 15 years, maybe 20 years. Um, and I just pretty much stash all my cocoons into the fanny pack. Um, keeps it super, super simple. And most of all, it keeps it efficient and keeps it lightweight because if I'm going to be hiking miles around the woods and the fields, I don't want to have to break a bigger sweat than what I'm going to anyway. Keep it simple, man. Insects, bugs, cocoons, they don't have to be real high tech and real hard, um, especially if you got a bunch of kids. I'd like to, I like to teach these kids to, to keep things very simple and very efficient. We're on the road and first cocoon of the morning is right there and I'm purposely doing this I'm not zooming in on it because I want to give everybody a chance to try and see that cocoon now the Sun is not directly on it yet it's kind of in the shade of one of the trees that's there maybe you can see it now if I shift it around a little bit that is a cocoon. That looks like a Promethea. I'm going to go over there and we'll get a close look at this. There it is, right there. Okay, and yep, that's a Promethea hanging in that tree right there. <laughs> it looks a lot higher than it is. We're going to get that and bring it down. This is our first cocoon of the day, and check this out. Watch this. Hear that? If you rattle them a little bit, you'll actually hear the pupa inside. So good one. First one. Okay, there's another one. And it too is a Promethea. Cool little silk moths common to the eastern U.S. And hanging right here in plain sight. So cool little silk moths and cool little cocoons. And we'll add this one to the box for the day. Do you remember I said if you watch the sunny side of the road, the cocoons will pop and glow? That right there, that is a Cecropia cocoon, man. Now I can tell right away there's a bird that broke into that cocoon. You can see the hole in the side of the cocoon. Now, the funny thing is, there is a second Cecropia cocoon right there. Look at that thing pop. Look at that glow, all right? It is easy to find these cocoons as long as you keep the sun at your back. So we're gonna go in, we're gonna dig these two cocoons out of here. The first Cecropia cocoon is right here. You can see where the bird tore into the cocoon. Now I can also see that there's a little bit of greenish tinge on this cocoon. This cocoon is probably two years old. So obviously not only is it dead, it probably would have been hatched even if a bird hadn't gotten into it. So we'll pull this one and take this with us. I always pull the cocoons because if I don't pull these old cocoons, the next time I come in, I'm going to end up staring at them all over again. So let's get rid of this one. Then we'll go over and we'll take a look at the other one. And here's the second cocoon. Pretty cool. And this one looks actually like it might be emerged. Yeah, this one feels, feels like it's probably already closed. But again, we're still going to take these two cocoons and move these out of here because if I leave old spent cocoons hanging in the trees they're gonna fool me every time I come back in and I'm gonna come back and look at the same things two and three times so we gotta pull these cocoons out of here but check it man two Cecropia cocoons and I haven't even left the truck in order to find these these were right along the road just driving down the road Here's another Promethea that I found right here along the road. Check it out. Vehicles. And right here in plain view hangs another Promethea cocoon. <clears throat> this one is also good. So, so far I'm um, three for three 
for Prometheus and still 0 for 2 on Secrobius. So let's uh, let's pull this one and we'll keep on moving. Guys, it's important to point out how the caterpillar spins the silk up onto the stem but also extends that silk sometimes quite a ways back on that stem. Uh, in the process, when you're going to pull these things, it's good to peel them and break that stem further back so that way you can hang these in a cage or whatever at home and you don't have to worry about interfering with the silk. This is a nice, a nice heavy one. That's a good, that's a good Promethea right there. Nice. Now, let's keep things in perspective here. Cocoons are made by the caterpillar. So the caterpillars are going to find the food plant, feed on it, and build cocoons. Cocoons are made in several different ways. Sometimes they're made very flimsy. Sometimes they're on the ground, just laying amongst the leaf litter. Sometimes they start out in the tree and they'll fall to the ground. Other times, they're going to be hanging in the trees. And most of the cocoons we find are the ones that are still stuck up in the trees, secured to the branch, just like this Cecropia cocoon right here, secured by the silk to the branch, where it's going to stay there. And inside the cocoon, looks just like this and there's several layers especially with the cecropia cocoon there's an outer layer then there's a small gap between the outer layer and the inner layer and that creates an insulation that air inside there is going to insulate that inner layer and inside the real hard inner layer which is also protective is going to be the pupa or the chrysalis and that's where the adult will come from obviously so that's what a cocoon is and this is what a cecropia cocoon looks like when you find them out in the wild very cool stuff this is a really old promethea cocoon look how it's got the green moss or mildew or whatever has already started growing on it so when you see them hanging in the trees and they have this green mold or uh mildew mossy stuff hanging off of them you're pretty well assured that that is an older cocoon so first Promethea I pulled so far this morning that isn't viable but still not a bad deal and again we pull these out of the trees so we don't come back and have to look at them a second time let's explore the Promethea silk moth because we're gonna see a lot of these cocoons today so let's explore a little bit about the moth that actually comes out of these cocoons it's a really really common moth in its range but i found that it's very food plant oriented so for instance we're collecting an area where there's a ton of spice bush um and that's a habitat thing man if you find spice bush odds are you'll find promethea cocoons because spice bush is a primary food plant of the Promethea silk moth, caterpillars that are going to eat that. The adults, just like all the other silk moths, the adults don't eat at all. So uh, the adult pictured right here, here's the male, and here is a female. These are beautiful moths, but they're small moths. They're only about three inches max. Uh, that would probably be a pretty average to even large size Promethea. Uh, most of the Prometheus I find are, are relatively small. They don't come to lights at night, so you can't attract these things to the lights because they're going to fly at about 4.30, 3.30, 4 o'clock in the afternoon. And that's when I see Promethea adults. The other option would be to uh, get some of these cocoons and have them hatch. If you can get a female to a close from the cocoon, you can then turn around and use that female to attract those males at about that same time of day. That 3.30 to 5.30 time period, that will normally get you a boatload of Promethea males coming in. And that's a ton of fun too. Um, and there you can see I had a female in a cage and this male found its way into the cage and hooked up with the female. So very, very simple, cool moths and a lot of fun for kids to learn on. So back to this cocoon, we're gonna be seeing a lot of these cocoons today. 
And without a doubt, we're going to be seeing a lot of these moths come this summer when we're hatching these cocoons out. So pretty cool stuff. We're also going to find the polyphemus cocoons hanging in trees. Now these can also be found on the ground. They're very difficult to find, but if you know where to look, preferably under uh, somewhat clean oak trees, a lot of times the leaves will blow off the ground and blow away, but the cocoons are just heavy enough that they don't go anywhere. So looking beneath oak trees uh, that haven't been walked on, mowed over, whatever the case is, as soon as that area clears out, you can find polyphemus cocoons. We find most of our polyphemus hanging in trees just like this because they stand out. They stick out just like the rest of the cocoons that we find. Luna cocoons, again, we have found luna cocoons hanging in trees, which really is not supposed to happen. But the caterpillars apparently have secured themselves to the main stem and rather than just the leaves they secure themselves to the main stem and that stem does not always drop off sometimes those stems are are hung on just enough that they don't fall off in the winter and we have found luna cocoons hanging in trees 99 percent of the time you're going to find luna cocoons on the ground because that's where they're supposed to go there they make them in the leaves they drop to the ground and that's how they find their protection it's harder for the animals and the predators to locate them Tulip tree cocoons are a lot like the, the Promethea, but they're obviously in tulip trees. Here's a comparison between tulip tree cocoon with a Promethea cocoon. And you'll notice the tulip trees a little bit bigger, a little bit fatter, a little bit longer. And it is, in fact, a larger moth as well. Not a lot bigger, but big enough that the cocoon does show a difference. I've reared the Promethea and tulip tree caterpillars in the same enclosure. And there is also a pretty distinct difference in size of the caterpillars to the tulip tree caterpillars. It's not significant necessarily, but they do get bigger, larger, fatter than the Prometheus on average. And we're back to my favorite, the Cecropia moth. Again, largest moths in North America. By far my favorite of moths because they are so uber cool. and amazing to rear. So I like to find Cecropia cocoons in order to hopefully close the females and then attract the males and raise out another bunch. And I try to do that every summer. Good stuff. Something that is very common with Cecropia moth cocoons is the fact that they are going to be chewed into by the birds. These are large cocoons. They stand out. The predators see them really easily. And because of that, those same predators, the birds and mostly birds, but other animals will, will try and chew into those cocoons, and rip the chrysalis out, the pupa out, and then make a meal out of it. And that's what ha that's what's happened here. Um, the, co the cocoon was hanging in the tree and the chrysalis was laying on the ground underneath it. So this, this did not happen very long ago. This was pretty fresh because it hasn't even warmed up enough really for ants to get in here yet, but the ants would have been all over that by now. But there you go. Classic example of predation on moth cocoons, especially the Cecropia moth. Great example right there. And those of you who aren't sure what a Cecropia moth looks like, Right there, that's what a Cecropia moth looks like. Guys, these are the largest moths in the United States. Largest moths in North America, and they are right here where we live. All throughout Eastern US. Very cool stuff. Beautiful moths. For this area of Pennsylvania, the region we live in here, South Central PA, this is pretty much it for our silk moths. I could get you into IO caterpillar and cocoons and fun stuff like that. Um, I don't find IO cocoons often. Um, the moths themselves are super. Here's a here's a nice pick of a of an IO moth male, and here's a picture of the female. Now again, we do not generally find these cocoons. It's just way easier just to put up lights at nighttime and bring these moths into the lights because they come into lights really, really effectively. For now, not everybody makes cocoons either. There's, there's going to be chrysalis. Some of these caterpillars are going to go underground. The regal moths 
right here one of my other favorites the regal moths and the imperials all go underground and uh, they don't even create a cocoon they just pupate underground in the substrate so don't expect to find cocoons for these particular moths but that's also what gives them the additional protection that they need because they're not hanging in trees where the birds are going to get them they're going to be under the ground i hate looking across a stream or a creek and seeing cocoons that i can't get to that drives me nuts and i am way too motivated to let those things go so rather than get my feet all wet i just prefer to wear boots and boots are simple because it allows me to cross the creek and get over here to check for these cocoons simple simple stuff so just another quick tip is i recommend you wear a pair of boots so you can cross the creek to get to the cocoons on the other side hey real quick i found uh four one two three four at least four cocoons hanging in this one tree right here um that is a real good example of when you find one you want to look for more and again the sun makes these things pop real nice it makes them glow so you can find them pretty easy just keep your back to the sun and keep looking there's your other one there's one two three four i think there's five actually in this tree but either way we're going to pull these out these all look like they're good cocoons uh i've met up with my group they're back there somewhere picking a bunch of cocoons um it's been a pretty good day so far we pegged some cecropia cocoons and we're finding a boatload of, of the uh, promethea cocoons but again I'm moving backwards through this. I'm looking out here in front of me. And the idea is to keep the sun to my back so that I can see what I want to look at. And it's not always safe to go walking backwards through the woods, especially near a creek, but that's how I do it some days. And I'm just going to take a real slow walk backwards, keep scanning around to see if I see anything popping out of those trees that looks like a cocoon. So let's see what else we find, man. I got to bunch of kids back here I got to go pay attention to uh, I'm with the group I've got them down inside here busting some brush and I'm gonna stay along this outside edge where I can keep my back to the Sun and I can look along this top edge here to see if there's any cocoons down in there that are gonna pop for us we have found a bunch of cocoons already we've only been in here for two hours so far and this was our take so far Um Prometheus mostly and then a whole bunch of cecropia which are cool and i don't think any of these cecropia which is a shame i don't think any of these cecropia are are viable i think they're all either emerged or bird broken this is a cool way to get your family get your kids out on a hike and find some bugs i have purposely silhouetted these to give you an idea these are bagworms this is a bagworm there is a larva in that likely a pupa in there if the larva is still in there it's probably just going to be overwintering and it will continue to crawl around and feed and do what bagworms do again these are native the moth is a small black little moth with clear wings just a just a super cool little bug but uh good example notice the pine needles that are on this thing this gives you an idea how far these things can travel there are pine trees all the way at the top of the ridge here and yet here's this bagworm down here at the very bottom of the hill next to the creek um, so they travel big distances and just another example of what is another cocoon but again not the kind of cocoons we're looking for so these guys get to stay sometimes you may find these on arborvitaes you may find hundreds of these things on your arborvitaes right in your yards and in your neighborhood super super common and uh, they get a bad rep because a lot of people think that they kill trees but they they don't necessarily kill trees it's rare that they do that they will defoliate in some cases or partially defoliate trees and shrubs but that normally is just uh, minor temporary stuff. It doesn't kill the bushes and kill the trees. Nature's good like that. And this would be our eighth Cecropia find for the day. Get an idea what these things look like when they're just camped out in the tree. And the funny part is, this is not far off the road, man. This is within 
pretty good view of anybody walking by here who might be looking around. But if you step off the path and you get in and you dig around a little bit, keep the sun at your back. These are the kind of cool things that you can find in the woods, especially right here in Pennsylvania. So that would make number eight for our three hour hike. Not so bad. This is what a praying mantis egg sack looks like. This is not a cocoon. It's an egg sack, but people confuse them a lot of times with cocoons and they're not. Again, if you were to take this home and keep this inside and warm it up, you'd end up with about 200 little baby praying mantises roaming around your house and that would be a bad, a bad thing because they will probably all die. So unless you plan on putting it in your, putting it in your garden and leaving it out there, it's probably best to leave these things sit or take it home and enjoy it. They're a lot of fun though, either way. Praying menace egg sacks, very common. And this would be number nine. This would be our ninth Cecropia cocoon for the day. But if you notice, it too has been torn into by a bird. So we are so far zero for nine on good Cecropia cocoons. Because I don't think anything we found this trip yet is alive. Or it's either hatched or bird eaten, but most of these have been bird eaten. So look guys, this is how it is. Super cool, super fun. It's a great day hike in the winter time. Uh, in this case, we're right here in mid-March. No leaves on the trees, not a lot of junk to have to sift through. You can find these cocoons very easily and it is good fun for everybody. Anybody can find cocoons. If you have trees and food plant and moths flying around, then you're gonna have the cocoons that generate those moths. You just have to get out and look. Hopefully it's gonna help you to find cocoons for yourself and most of all, discover what kind of things are going on in your backyards. Guys, I'm giving you back your day. You can find me over on Facebook. You can find me here on YouTube. Like it, subscribe it, please. And you guys have a great day.